No, I, I think, unfortunately, that's true. And in fact, I was going to say, I think my presence is largely superfluous to requirements because there's obviously consensus here. And most of us who've spent time in, in legislatures, in the national legislature, certainly, this has been our experience. Uh, the anti-defection law is actually symptomatic of a larger problem. But certainly, what I was trying to say in my piece is that the entire representative nature of a legislature uh, has been undermined and diluted by various factors, of which this may well be amongst the most important. Um, there was a Burkean concept. After all, we borrowed everything from the British, including the designation of speaker, which I agree with you is absurd. Other countries at least call you the president of the chamber or whatever. But we have the speaker thing, and the speaker doesn't speak or is not meant to, uh, unless we have some acting chairpersons who prefer to speak from the chair rather than from their own seat. And that's happened to me quite recently. Um, but digressions apart, the fact is that in borrowing these conventions from the British, we didn't borrow the spirit of them. And uh, the Burkean concept of famous speech to the electors of Bristol in 1772, I think it was, uh, he essentially said, look, uh, you've given me your vote. Once you voted for me, you no longer have any control over me. It's up to me to exercise my judgment, my knowledge, my awareness. I will not take instructions from anybody else or from you. And if you don't like how I'm representing you, vote for somebody else next time. Now, that is very clearly and simply the classic concept of what a legislator's responsibility is. That is that he or she is presenting themselves as capable through their education, their political ideology, their convictions, their background, as the person most fit and qualified to articulate the interests of their constituents and the larger national interest. He also argued parliament is not merely a collection of people representing different areas and different interests who would come to some sort of consensus. No. Once you're elected to parliament, the national interest has to predominate. And you should speak not only for your constituency, but for the larger national thing. And if the constituency doesn't like your national focus, then don't vote for you again. Now that, I think, was very much the spirit in which the, the whole parliamentary system was conceived. The Burkean analogy still holds good in the, in the UK today. But in India, if it did, it did so roughly between about 1952 and 1967. Thereafter, the thing started falling apart, and the phenomenon of defections had the effect on parties of consolidating their authority much more, because they said, the only way we can prevent this is A, through the passage of the anti-defection law, B, through instituting a system in which a whip applies essentially to every bill. It is either an explicit whip with a written notice by SMS to all of us, or it is an implicit whip where while you're in the house, if there's been no time to issue a notice, you are told by the floor leaders, this is the way we will vote. And in these circumstances, this is true of all parties. It's not just a, a Congress problem. And so the problem uh, we, we face with all of this is that we are uh, having to put our individual ideas, our consciences in sort of a blind trust to which the key is controlled only by the leader of the party. Now this, to begin with, fundamentally undermines the entire notion of representation. It also dilutes the value of the debate. Uh, and I've mentioned in the article uh, some of my own experiences with this, that where even commonsensical suggestions by opposition MPs, which are not even particularly political or ideological, or which need not have bothered, and sometimes with which many members of the ruling party, while listening to you, seem to be on, uh, in overt agreement, will never be accepted by the ruling party, because they push their draft through the cabinet, and that draft is the one that's going to be passed because they've got the majority and they've issued a will. So the irony is we have now reduced parliamentary debates not to the uh, creation of a policy or a law through a deliberative process. We've reduced it to something where we're just placing things on the record that perhaps LSTV and RSTV will issue on YouTube and people will watch outside and, and they will know that at least we stood up for certain things. Rather like Asad and his divisions. Actually, everything Asad said was perfect right up to that very end, but this de demanding a division overlooks one small complication, which is that other parties don't only vote on the substance of a bill when a division is called. They vote on whether a division is tactically appropriate at that time on that issue, and they vote on whether they want to be identified with the party or the individual calling for that particular division on that particular issue. So, 
it is not just, I mean, in the case of the, of the triple talaq bill, the Congress's position was that it is not in favor of triple talaq, but it is not in favor of criminalizing a matter of personal law. I'm, I'm summarizing, it's a much more complicated issue, but I'm giving key thing. So when Assad pushes a, a, a vote or a division on one particular clause of a, of a bill, it's entirely possible for the Congress to not agree with him on that clause, but to agree with uh, him on the overall bill. But we don't have a chance to do that because the division's already been called for. Any member can call for a division. That's about the only freedom members have left now. Uh, but even then, uh, uh, we had a situation yesterday where a member called for a division and his party preferred a walkout. So he, the very member who had called for a division was obliged to walk out and not participate in the division he had called for. These are things that happen. I mean, the party is ruling supreme. And the irony is the word party is not mentioned in the Constitution or in our laws until the anti-defection law came in. So where does the supremacy of party emerge from? It is not implicit in any of the language of the Constitution that the party's interests must prevail over that of the individual legislature. So we are in a, in a position, I've heard various suggestions being mentioned in the course of the discussion as to how we can improve the, um, the, the approach by restricting defection. Uh, first of all, you can restrict the whip only to confidence votes. That's one possibility, uh, which means that the disqualification will not be attracted if you vote against your party on lesser than confidence votes. But in practice, given the dominance of the party in every aspect and the fact that the party controls whether you'll get a ticket or not, how on earth are you going to challenge your own party on a matter that, on an issue that matters to them? In fact, strictly speaking, even absence from a vote where you've been commanded to vote on a certain issue um, uh, is considered disloyalty to the party. Uh, and, and very many parties, certainly we know this of the BJP, they will ask for an explanation in writing why somebody was not there. And the Prime Minister has been known to pull up MP for not being there. So, in these circumstances, even that reform that has been suggested will be illusory. No party, de facto, is going to indulge uh, open rebellion, even on a seemingly unimportant issue. I mean, no issue that really comes to vote in Parliament is unimportant, but an issue that will not bring down the government uh, and still uh, a weapons issue. Then other suggestions that have been made uh, is to change the, the authority of the Speaker, because as you know, the Speaker gets to decide um, whether to accept a request for disqualification against the ADL. So in a couple of state assemblies, I think Andhra and Telangana, if I'm right, there have been cases in which members defected to the ruling party. And the speaker was, of course, from the ruling party. So he just didn't take action on the recommendation by their original party to expel them. Now, <clears throat> in these situations, I think in the first one, it was the present GSCM of Andhra Pradesh was the victim. It was Jagan Mohan Reddy's 23 MLAs who switched en masse to Telugu Desam and Telugu Desam one day. They became ministers. And half of them became yeah. ministers. <laughs> and then they, a similar story happened in Telangana where people defected to the ruling TRS. And the problem is that, strictly speaking, under the law, only the speaker can decide on disqualification. So I think I had Manish or someone suggest, why don't we have an independent um, uh, uh, person with authority, like a, a judge can come in and make that decision and not that. But, I mean, frankly, number one, does that not undermine the, the independence of the legislature? And number two, I mean, you've just seen us raising a very valid point that more and more of the authority of the legislature has been abdicated to the judiciary. The judiciary has now taken upon itself, there are meant to be three co-equal branches of government. The executive acts, the legislature holds it accountable, the judiciary interprets both the work of the legislature and the actions of the executive. But by so doing, the judiciary has essentially become the, the most powerful institution to then tell the executive that it can't do something and it can tell the legislature to do something or even also not to do something. Uh, and, and that again raises questions because of course the judiciary is appointed by the executive at bottom uh, and, and the uh, executive's influence over the judiciary is so great that the judiciary becoming the, um, the, the most powerful institution actually also potentially uh, seriously undermines the effectiveness of the opposition in our democracy. I've spoken too much, but I mean, broadly speaking, all these concerns mean we have a problem, and whatever solution we have is not, frankly, going to be enough of a solution. So I just want to, uh, you know, this having ADL is, is having a social impact on our politics. I'll give you two examples. When a uh, reservation was being given on economic grounds, I happened to speak to many uh, 
scheduled caste MPs. And at least 20, 25 of them were really upset. Now, because of ADL, they cannot voice. Because